Hi, this is Carl Polichuk. I am the Executive Director of the National Society of IT Service Providers. And we held a meeting June 15th and pushed the recording button just a little bit late. <laughs> so, so I'm going to give you just the first couple of slides and then uh, we'll go to the recording of the actual meeting. So this meeting is presented by myself and Amy Babinchek, who is the President of the Board of Directors of the NSITSP. And we are here to welcome all the vendors and to describe the vendor partner program and how you can participate. So this is a picture of Amy and I in Australia a few years ago. And I, I was really happy when Amy picked this picture <laughs> just because it so very much represents us. We are looking out over the water at a monster huge jellyfish and wondering what we've gotten ourselves into as we make our way to Moreton Island. And the reason I say this represents us, Amy and I have worked together and separately to literally just support and build the SMB IT consulting community for about 20 years. And so this is sort of culminated in the last year of us helping to found the National Society of IT Service Providers. And as you will see, our goal, our mission is to increase the professionalism of this industry. And in fact, to help this industry now that it is mature, become a profession. It used to be that we could say that the clients of IT firms were under attack, but we are not under attack. Sure, our staff could just as easily fall victim to a phishing email, but generally they didn't. Tech staff generally seemed to be immune from social attacks, and we sat back smugly knowing that there was no malware incident in our systems in the last couple of decades. <clears throat> it couldn't happen to us because we're the smart ones. Then it did. <laughs> As ransomware increased 300% in 2020 from the previous year, and it's not like they were starting from zero, and the ransom themselves went from $300 in 2013 to millions of dollars in 2020, suddenly our trusted, unattended remote access tools got hacked, and companies became household names for all the wrong reasons. Our vendors were now uh, talked about by the media and legislators and not in a good light. At first, the blame was placed upon the tool manufacturers, but that narrative was subsequently uh, shifted to MSPs and MSSPs. Our entire industry was dragged through the mud. When a cybersecurity news story breaks, you hear some really silly things from the media because they don't understand. Why would you have this tool that's so dangerous? Why would you have this RMM thing? What is that thing? And what does it mean? And why would you hire somebody else to take care of your security? Why would you outsource your IT? We know the answer to all of these questions. It's because this business is complex and hard. And so you need tools and you need experts and the technical business can't protect itself from uh, anything without these tools. But we're the only ones that know that. Our voice was literally uh, missing from this news story. And it's been missing from the legislatures and it's missing from everything. Now we need a seat at the table. IT firms were rightly called out for not applying patches to their own systems. Right? for using old versions of software, for not adopting multi-factor authentication. Those are unforgivable sins if you're out there calling yourself a professional. We can do better and the consumer deserves to be able to make a distinction between companies and individuals. Right now we're a black box to them and that needs to change. The attacks on our industry have continued. Errors in emissions insurance have rates have doubled, tripled, even quadrupled for some tech firms. Cyber insurance put in exclusions for paying ransoms, and many small businesses are deciding to simply take their chances instead of paying high premiums and potentially have a claim denied. The state of Louisiana was first out of the gate with MSP and MSP regulation. Many other states are now considering them, and all it will take to push that forward is another major incident. And I think it's safe to say that incident is going to come. 
since solar winds and Kitsia had their good names dragged through the mud with negative press, the world has not become a safer place. That horrible treatment could happen to any of us. And now the federal government's getting into our business too. Right? For our clients, the IRS started applying the anti-terrorism rules, saying it's illegal to fund terrorism, which they define as paying ransom to certain known criminal organizations. And now they want reporting on everything that is spent greater than $600 so they can track ransom payments even more closely. For those firms whose best option out of a bad situation is to pay the ransom, this could be really disastrous. As CISA right, has been on a publishing tear telling everyone uh, from enterprise to small business what they need to consider when hiring an IT service firm of any stripe. And that document even addresses how to protect your business from an MSB. That is definitely not a message that is good for our industry. Right? CISA is not speaking for us. They are speaking out against us. Several of us wrote to CISA and recently they've kind of changed their tone, but their overall message is still for firms to protect themselves from our industry. And that is not how we want to be viewed now, is it? But one of our goals is to change that narrative. You are up, Carl. Oh, you're, you're muted, Carl. Carl. <clears throat> Got it. All right. So with regulations, one of the things that's happened is that uh, several of the states have regulated us and are looking at licensing us, and they're talking about us in all the states. Um, the media are reporting about us, and, and not in a good way. Uh, we've been noticed by several organizations, including businesses and governments, uh, and there's a great call for cybersecurity education by local business groups and a skyrocketing market for providing cybersecurity uh, to businesses of all sizes. The good news is that uh, we're all making money. The bad news is that the governments and businesses are wondering who we are <laughs> and kind of what we're up to. Uh, we're in a black box to them and they want to shed some light into that box. Um, they want to know which firms are qualified and which might not be. Uh, and, you know, are you making solid software? Are you offering the right services? They want to know what qualifies you to do the job that you claim you're doing uh, or that uh, others are saying that you're doing. The federal government can't reach down into the states and regulate us or license us, but state and local governments can, and those politicians have noticed who we are, uh, you know, I've said last year, you know, they're talking about us and we don't have a seat at the table. <laughs> so we do have a reputation problem. Um, and basically it's a very serious one. The business world needs to know that we care that, uh, and they need to know that we have an outstanding group of professionals and lots of reputable firms. There's no lack of educational opportunities in our industry, but there is a lack of accountability at taking that education seriously. There's no lack of vendors taking security quite seriously, but there is a lack of trust from the business community. So there's no lack of uh, IT firms, but there is no way for the consumer to know which firms they should choose. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we need to have licensing or regulation or required degrees. What we are saying is that we need to do something that's one of the things that the National Society of IT Service Professionals is going to do. It's going to figure out what we need to do to get it right, right? We need to make sure that our ship is upright and heading in the right direction. We're at a point in our industry where we need to hold each other accountable and to decide to let the law and government hold us accountable. So we need to hold each other accountable. We need to set high standards for what we are going to do as an industry. So we are becoming uh, a new organization. The, the, the SMBIT community literally didn't exist 25 years ago in any meaningful way. Uh, and now we need to come together and we need to form what will be the future of this industry. Um, so do you wanna go over the mission super quick? Um, yeah, so we took some time to figure out the mission, vision and values of 
of this organization. And so our, our mission is what, what drives the day-to-day -day work of the organization. And that is we provide pathways to establish high standards and ethics to improve perception and credibility of the IT profession through actions driven by member engagements. We do want this to be a member-driven organization. We do view it as a, a grassroots movement that needs to occur. For vision, um, you know, we want the NSITSP to, to be the voice of the industry, to define and define the standards of what it means to be a professional in IT services, right? And this vision defines what we're hoping to achieve together by this membership. And then we also uh, set up a number of, of values that are important to the organization. And I'm not gonna really take time to go through those, but just know that this is a lot of what we have been thinking about um, as, a, as a board and building out this national organization and setting it up for, for success. And those are all on our website as well. Yeah. Um, so there've been a lot of questions among IT providers and, and vendors alike. Um, about whether this organization is just another in a long list in our industry. So we have specific organizational principles that I wanted to, to tell you about. But um, the answer is, is really that we are guided by these organization principles. It's modeled upon others that have gone before us like professional engineering, accounting, legal, trades, project managers, and, and more, right? We formed an organization that is bottom up structure where individuals and corporations are equal in representation, just as they are equal in their desire and need to work in a professional industry. Right? Individuals are associated with corporation. Each corporation gets one vote. All paid members are able and encouraged to take board and committee seats. However, in keeping with our grassroots mission, none will be dominated by vendors. Instead, we're gonna strike a balance on each of, those, each of those committees and make sure everyone has an equal voice. No one else is focused on turning this industry into a recognized profession. That is our big overarching goal. As you can imagine, starting an organization like this is a huge task, right? The Rotary was not built overnight. <laughs> Just getting through the initialization of phase has been a huge effort. I mean, Carl and I are amazed at the breadth of experience and the talent that people have brought to this organization and thankful for all the volunteers that have gotten us from zero to a solid infrastructure that is prepared to be a thriving national trade organization. But we need your help to move from the organizational phase into the action phase, and we have plans and dreams to be fulfilled. Our goal is to define what it means to be an IT professional and to have those requirements be akin to other industries so that when businesses are evaluating firms to contract with, or individuals to hire, that they have some objective measurement that they understand, right? These might be things like continuing education requirements, the adoptions of ethics statements, the ability to review recommendations from previous clients and, and so on. But we also know that we have a huge need to educate members of the public, like media, legislators, their staff, business leaders, the more they understand our industry and can relate it to what they already know, the better it will be for everyone. So we have to get out of being a black box so that those to those that, are, that might control our futures. And some of the ways that we intend to do that are to develop our membership into effective voices for the industry and to teach them to self-advocate so that we have a voice when legislators and, meeting our, and media are talking about us. And we then expect to get involved in lobbying and alliance building with other industries too. We have some challenges to overcome before we can get there though, right? We need this industry to be healthy and successful, right? We need the insurance industry, not just to raise rates, but to understand us and become our partners in fighting the very things that caused the claims in the first place. We have to continue to work to overcome technical limitations that allow ransomware and other attacks on security of business to continue. We have a challenge to become viewed as a legitimate qualified voice. One of the first questions that legislators ask is what makes you qualified? Do you have a degree? They do. Right? Uh, that's how they view the world. Who represents you? They ask. No one. 
right? Most people in the industry do not have a degree in computer science, nor do they carry any kind of certification. There is no common banner that we all get behind. That makes it very difficult to convince the power that be that you are legit. Seeing this, they'll immediately put you into the semi-skilled general labor category, right? So unless we can shift to this into a profession, the respect is never going to come. And we will be done too, instead of consulted about our future. Our, our challenges are large. You know, it's somewhat humorous that we were talking about haircuts before this. <laughs> you need a license to cut your hair, no matter how poorly. <laughs> but you can take over a $7 million computer operation just because you have a business card that says IT professional. So the, yep. the world is, is changing significantly. Yep. Because our challenges are so large, this is why we need our vendor partners to, to join with us. We, we need each other to make this happen. Our success is interdependent. So clearly there's a need. So why the National Society of IT Service Providers? Um, well, the bottom line is no one else is doing this. And it's not that they are falling down. It's not their charge. You know, if you think about Good to Great by Jim Collins, you know, we I hope everybody here has read that. If not, go read it. Uh, but we need to look and say, what can we do better than anybody else? What's the one thing that we can do? And uh, no one has the charge. No one is focused on improving this industry and turning it into a profession, a true profession that is well-respected, that has a successful business model where people who get into it can uh, come in as newbies and uh, learn the skills of running a business, being in this industry, knowing who the vendors are and who the distributors are and how you build a successful system, and then moving forward, forward and maturing and helping the entire uh, community rise up together. And so between ransomware and regulation and all the things that Amy talked about, we truly are at a critical moment in our history. And this is true for the vendors as well as for the IT service providers. The vendors need us, we need them. We literally only exist as a community because together, we literally need each other to succeed because we need each other to succeed. We, we need strong vendors who provide good products, good services that are reliable, that we can depend on. They need good partners who can grow, who have a good reputation. That doesn't make them look bad in front of uh, either the public, their clients, uh, business people, <laughs> uh, the government, right? We need each other to succeed. And that's why when we talk about the symbiotic piece of this, it is absolutely true. We need to do this together. We could do it without vendors, I'll be honest. It would just take a very, very long time because we need the other half of the community to be fully engaged. So let me give a couple of stats. So uh, as of this morning, we have, uh, you know, uh, over 600 people who have registered as members on our site at some level. And uh, so the stats in terms of the people who filled out the form that said, you know, hey, you're a member, tell us about you. Uh, we, as a rule, um, you know, the, the biggest bulk are making over uh, 500000 or $100,000 uh, a year. Um, I think it's fairly representative of our industry as a whole. This may or may not be your uh, partners today, but uh, you know this is this is who we are now, and we think it's fairly representative. Um, next, and uh, so in terms of uh, who who we serve, most of the people here, um, you know, when we ask them, you know, how many clients they serve, most of them have between uh, twenty and fifty right? That's the absolute bulk, the majority of, of the folks who are out there. So these are, you know, true SMB IT consultants. And now we want to talk about the actual vendor program. So uh, the membership piece, 
uh, is only $100 a year. If you wanted to join as a member, that gets you one vote. It allows you to sit on committees and vote in elections. I encourage you to download a PDF version of this if you want to uh, scan the QR code uh, or go to uh, nsitsp.com slash vendors. And um, on that site, uh, you'll see this where you, it's a little easier to read, but basically uh, the vendor partner program is separate from the membership in that um, it is actually a more of a charitable membership. Um, and we need to make sure that, that when you look at the program, uh, I don't want vendors to think of this as an advertising opportunity. And I know many of you, that's, that's sort of your first knee-jerk reaction because that's the way things are done in this industry. But when you give money to something and you expect something back, there really needs to be a, a visible ROI in dollars. And I, I want folks to take a slightly different view of this and think about this is an investment in your industry to build strong partners so that 5, 10, 20 years from now, we will have a powerful industry made up of massively successful partners who, who then help support massively successful vendors. And uh, that's, that's the long-term uh, goal. Uh, you can't think of ROI the same as you do when you say, well, I'm going to join this group. I'm going to give them $5,000 and I'm going to have a booth at, a, at the uh, show. That's not what we're up to here. And some of you may just simply say, that's it, I'm out. And, and you know, it is what it is. Uh, but I believe that we have a lot of vendors who, are, who understand the bigger picture and understand that long term, we absolutely need each other. And we have so many challenges. Like if we look ahead just to run the organization and, and, you know, yesterday I met with the legislative committee and they were like, okay, so the first thing we knew is we need at least one volunteer in every state to just keep an eye on the state legislature, right? Things like that, this, this undertaking is far bigger than we even realized it was when we started. Um, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. That just means it's going to take longer and it's going to need some resources. One of those resources is strong vendor partners. Amy? So with the vendor partner program, you will get a membership that, that will be included. And we really want vendors to sit on the board and sit on committees. We do have vendors on our board. We do have some very powerful uh, uh, vendors who are participating in our committees and have been tremendous contributors uh, to the intellectual side of building this organization. Um, but we want lots of vendors to be in this organization. We want them to help us guide the industry. You know, it's interesting as a consultant, sometimes I'll go into a client's office and I remember one guy in particular, he gave advice to a specific, specific industry and I would be in there working on things and he would just have these conversations where it was clear he knew more about the technical side of their industry than they did because he, he came from a certain financial perspective. Uh, and in the same way, vendors sometimes know more than the IT service providers about certain aspects of our industry because they see it from a completely different perspective. We need that perspective. We need you to sit on these committees and say, well, don't forget about this or be aware of that, right? That kind of diversity of viewpoint will make us all stronger. And you know, maybe I'm pie-eyed, but I got to say, I think this industry has an amazing future. Like we might only be about 20 years old, but the next hundred years are going to be phenomenal. Um, we want your voice on what we're going to do. Uh, with luck, we will be able to put together a conference next year. Uh, we are monitoring legislation already. And uh, with luck, we will begin building the relationships that allow us to actually have some influence when legislation is being discussed. Uh, we want to build educational programs at all levels for the media, for lobbyists, for members, for vendors. Uh, ultimately, we would love to be able to be the first organization that people think about when they think about anything related to IT. You know, uh, IT 
service providers get a little irritated when they show up at a client's office and they say, hey, we've got a new ISP. And <laughs> they hadn't talked to the, the uh, technical consultant about that. Well, it's the same way. We don't want people to talk about us with us uh, unless we have a seat at the table and are in the room when we're being discussed. Uh, so overall, I can't promise you a lot, except that the long-term goal is to have a much stronger industry and a true profession and to have partners who are very successful and are able to support you, the vendors, in everything that you need to do to be successful. All right, uh, please download that, uh, go to the site. And I think, unless Amy has something else to add, we're open for questions and comments. Open for questions and comments. This is, uh, this is the end of our presentation. So I hope that we gave you guys some food for thought, that we piqued your interest in the organization and that you will, that you will consider joining us. Um, you know, we, I, I, don't, I don't see how an organization, a trade association moves forward without everyone in the, in the organization. We can't do it with just half. You know, we don't want to do this with one hand tied behind our back. We want equal representation from the vendors and the IT service providers and to really build this out into something phenomenal and desperately needed for our organization, for our industry to move forward. So thank you for attending today. Um, Carl and I will take a look at the chat, throw in any questions in there. We would love to discuss you, this with you. Um, we would love to give your feedback as well. So, you know, um, shoot us an email. It is not difficult to find Carl's email or my email. Just type type our name into Google and there it'll be. <laughs> so, and, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, well, the, the good thing about having a name like Babinchak or Palachuk is the 21st century. It's you can even misspell it. You'll still find us. So uh, <laughs> Stuart has a question that maybe it was answered in, in the presentation about what we intend to do with the money. Um, well, so first, uh, we have a preliminary budget, which we've uh, put up into a blog post on the site. We're going to present it. Actually, the finance committee talked this morning about presenting our budget uh, a little more easy for people to access. Uh, but uh, we, first of all, assuming that we get uh, some serious funds, we will need somebody to run the organization full time, um, you know, and organize the volunteers. Uh, we also will need to create educational materials. Like I said, for example, uh, with videos, I would love to have us be able to put some materials together for the media so that the next time that uh, you go on vacation for the 4th of July and there is a cyber attack that the media will have a place to go to download some materials. What is an MSP? What is an RMM? What are these tools? Why do you outsource your technical support? And then uh, they can connect with a local partner and say, okay, I've put together this five minute story for the six o'clock news. Now I need 30 seconds from a, a local MSP to, to finish off the story. And that partner will have been trained up a little bit on how you talk to the media and how you present yourself and have some talking points. All of that takes organization and money and resources and preparation, right? So that's the kind of thing we wanna do. Eventually, I would love to have us have a kind of a, a continuing education credit program that so many industries have. Um, we already have just an unbelievable group of people on our committees. The, Amy alluded to this, the talent that we have is phenomenal. And the number of people who have been involved in other organizations is just amazing. So um, there's no shortage of things for us to do. And I'd be happy to discuss uh, if you go to the site, if you go to the, the nsitsp.com or .org slash vendors, uh, you can schedule a meeting and we will we'll schedule a meeting on Zoom or Teams and uh, talk to you about the details. I'll be happy to share uh, the uh, budget that's been approved by the board. So Ari, Ari brings up the, the topic of um, subpar quality uh, IT providers out there. And, um, you know, one of the things that is very important uh, to this organization is that we don't 
prevent anyone from entering the industry, right? We all got here by hanging out a shingle. And we all do want to still make sure that there is a pathway for that to happen. Um, and, you know, I remember early on in our discussions, Carl, you told me about the construction industry in California, that if you are licensed, you get to bill at a higher rate than if you're unlicensed, you're restricted by the state of California as to what you're allowed, what size of jobs you're allowed to bill for, right? Now you can't, so, you can't do a job <clears throat> over $600 without having a contractor's license. Yeah, and you know, what I think to myself is, doesn't the consumer deserve to understand the difference between the guy that works at the oil chain shop and a master mechanic? We have the same problem in our industry, but there's no way for the consumer to make an intelligent decision. And so, um, you know, that's that's what I really see as the the, fun, the fundamental problem. And we need to make sure that there's a path toward getting from, you know, start to a profession, recognize, being a recognized professional. Um, and Carl, I'm going to let you take the question from Ben about how we're different than CompTIA. Both you and I have served on the executive committees over there, and you're currently more involved than I am. Yeah, and uh, there might be, I, well, I know <laughs> Corey's on the board, and he's uh, he's a member of the year at CompTIA. Uh, I sit on the uh, executive council for one of the uh, forums for advancing tech, talent, and diversity. Um, but, you know, it's interesting, we, there might be somebody else from CompTIA here. Um, uh, we're working with CompTIA to see which things we have in common uh, that we might be able to push forward. Uh, CompTIA fundamentally has removed themselves from influencing the government. They used to have an entire arm whose job was to lobby. And um, what they found was that it was largely funded by the larger vendors, the, the likes of Microsoft and Amazon and Apple. <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, they took some stands that may not necessarily be what the smaller IT service providers would have liked. Uh, and so uh, they have removed themselves from the lobbying side of things. Um, now, having said that, they really have expressed a strong interest in working with us to educate members, which they're very good at. Uh, and clearly, uh, they have some certification programs that will help members improve. Um, and so we have a lot of things in common, but uh, I mentioned before, we need to focus on what we can do better than anybody else. And uh, CompTIA is interested in creating generalized policies uh, for IT service providers, um, but they represent all vendors and all, all partners of all sizes. And uh, their focus is not to educate legislators or the media. Uh, it is not to advance the legislative agenda of uh, the IT industry. Um, so we have a good symbiosis <laughs> with CompTIA and are building those partnerships as we speak. Um, but uh, we, we do have a different mission than they do. And, you know, uh, somebody might ask the same thing of, of ASCII or, or other groups. There's no shortage of groups but there, what we found is that there's a gap that's not being filled and it is the gap of increasing the professionalism of the entire industry while trying to address some just monster problems that I think a lot of people couldn't have even foreseen where we would be just 10 years ago with regard to ransomware and legislation. So I hope that answers that. Other uh, questions from vendors about specifics or uh, concerns or anything? And you're free to open your microphone and just ask. Um, well, there is um, <clears throat> there is one there from uh, Mendy Green. He's asking what we're doing to improve the MSP themselves currently, and specifically about ethics and standards and whatnot. Um, there is a there is a committee that is working on uh, developing an ethics statement. And the membership committee um, and the governance committees themselves are tackling that, that question now of how to, how to raise those, how to raise the bar and what that means for the, 
for the IT service provider. Remember, this isn't limited specifically to MSPs. We have a lot of different business models out there. We want to make sure that everyone is encompassed in, in the solution. And, you know, long term, I, I don't expect that this organization will create classes or anything like that, but there's so many places to get education uh, that I think that it is appropriate for this organization to, uh, you know, basically approve training systems to say, okay, that is that counts towards continuing education. And maybe someday we will even have continuing education as uh, a uh, one of the requirements for a certain level of membership. So, you know, I, it's a long-term strategy. None of this is going to fix the world overnight, um, <clears throat> but I'm hoping it'll help it <laughs> get pointed in the right direction uh, in, so, in surprising short order. Go ahead. It's interesting because I'm, I'm a, honestly, I'm, I'm, an, at an, I'm an MSP. Uh, I am at an MSP. Wow, that's hard to say. But I'm also MSP geek, um, <laughs> which is how I found myself in, a, in this call, I think, which was for vendors. But the, um, at MSP geek, we're looking to build something similar to what you described in terms of, because uh, like our MSP Geek's vision is, you know, like a rising tide raises all ships, right? Um, we're looking to build something similar in, from a training platform so that we can standardize uh, tier levels so that when someone says they're a tier one, what does that actually mean, right? And when there's a tier one at one company, whether it's a technical department or MSP or VAR or whatever, and they come to another company, now they're tier one, are they at the same level? What base foundational knowledge do they have? Um, I'm actually in charge of creating a training platform. It's not, not really classes, but a certification process where we can say or test someone and say, okay, you've qualified for tier one, tier two, tier three, or as an engineer, and then this is the level you're now at. So it's interesting because I think there are also other places that are doing similar things. And if we all come together, I think that we can actually unify <clears throat> on something that A, will go faster, hopefully, and B, that everyone can agree and acknowledge on. Like that's the hardest part is getting standardization. That means that people have to accept it across the board. Yep. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, uh, you'll be getting an invitation for a podcast soon. Um <laughs> The, uh, you know, there's two things that really stand out about this industry, which is why I literally fall in love with this industry every year. <laughs> One is that uh, anybody, anywhere, like a new social media shows up, people will show up and say, hey, I'm an IT nerd. And I have this question about charging something or about a technical problem or about a, a client issue or whatever. And people come out of the woodwork to help them. This industry, literally more than anything I've ever seen in other industries, people want to help each other as sort of the first reaction to problems. Uh, and there are exceptions, but for the most part, that's the rule. And the second thing is this industry uh, has such a powerful need for education that I think uh, the we couldn't fulfill all the educational needs if we wanted to, uh, because there's so many people who want to be educated and want to step up, both on the business side and the, on the technical side. So uh, that's why I say I don't see the NSITSP actually like offering classes per se, but I do see us working with all kinds of educators on technical and professional things to say, you know, how do we improve everything in the industry uh, in order to help us all move forward. And, you know, there's, there, I don't know of another industry that works as well together as we do. There's absolutely no lack of educational opportunities in this industry. What there is a lack of is people willing to take them, people understanding that that's an important step for their career, for um, the, uh, the people that hire the IT folks to actually value those, because we're seeing we're beginning to see a sea change in that. Right when I started in this industry, if you did not have a certification from Novell or Microsoft, you were not getting a job. Period, and um, we're seeing that change back into more of that model again, where the certifications are are becoming important and are going to are going to be enforced and 
Microsoft is leading that charge and it looks like Cisco is getting back into the game as well. So um, <clears throat> I, do, I do see that coming. Um, but like Carl said, that this organization's place is not to provide education at all. So, um, so no chance that we're going to be competing with you. This is, this is a membership organization, right? This is about industry building. This is about professionalism. Um, the bits and pieces of, of, how that, of how that work will be provided by, by you, not by us. Amy, this is, uh, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Hey, hey Ben. ben. Hey, th this is Ben Yarbrough with uh, Calypsic Security. Um, first and foremost, I want to applaud you guys for the effort. Um, as a lawyer turned crazy uh, IT entrepreneur, uh, you know, you guys are speaking truth. And some of it's scary and, and some of it's very exciting. But I think you're, you're moving in a very positive direction. Hey, so, ben, you probably know the history of the legal <laughs> Uh, industry and how the legal, how the, how the bar formed. And I mean, we're essentially, we're just following this same well-trodden path of an industry. Yeah. I don't know the history, but I certainly remember filling out my 50 page bar application for the state of North Carolina <laughs> for 20 years of uh, everything. But uh, I was going to suggest that is actually a great model. And if, you know, there are a lot of things that are about there and I, I missed the first intro, but if I hear you right, you're saying that the purpose of this organization is to drive the professionalism of the IT services. And that is both is going to entail education standards and quite likely the recognition you've got state uh, legislation. And, you know, you're right, Carl, cosmetologists, uh, landscape architects, people that put out uh, chemicals on grass, lawyers, uh, contractors, all these guys are regulated in every state. They have to have a license. And one way to approach that is with a model statute. I don't know how, and I, I want to dig deeper into how you guys want to spend your budget and your money, but speaking directly to creating a prototype model for every state to consider as a state statute on how to regulate IT professionals, th that's typically a way to drive a standard. And, you know, for lawyers, that's approval by the state bar. The bar happens to be funded. The bar is funded by the fees that lawyers pay to the state. You know, that's continuing education requirements. That's ethics standards. You know, all that's bolted into the to statute and it's driven down to a county by county uh, oversight in, in, in the state of North Carolina. So there is a huge parallel opportunity. Uh, I think, you know, again, I applaud you. I look forward to getting involved uh, and learning more. We would love to have you on the legislative committee. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, yeah. can, Amy, can I have can I say something real quick? Sure. Sure. Um, as for vendors, I, I, I'm going to say this. Uh, I started my MSP 10 years ago, and it was a dream three years prior to that. I never Googled anything to start my business. My my dream was to help the small business people to have the tools that the enterprise people get. And that was my goal. And that was my dream. When this came about, it was like, oh, my gosh, if I had this 10 years ago, I would have had an easier path and a better path to provide better service when I first started versus continually building vendors. I mean, I saw Eric Erickson on here. I remember taking several of his classes. I remember going the first thing I thought of, get, get in with Microsoft, get in with HP, get in with all the big boys. But then I slowly go, what RMM am I going to use? What backup system am I going to use? With you all, when you hear somebody, hey, I'm a new MSP, this will be a great opportunity as a vendor to say, listen, here's an organization that's going to help you give you some type of path and some type of guidance. And I think that if I had that 10 years ago, I would probably be further ahead than I am today. But I, I really rely on the vendors that, you know, hey, help us out. And I'm seeing more and more, like Carl said, more and more people are reaching out and helping others out. And this is what it's all about. 
And I appreciate Carl and Amy really putting this together. And I'm part of the, on the uh, membership committee. And, and so is Christopher Barber. We both work together. And this has been a tremendous ride. And it, it's roller coaster, but we really would really love to have you all help us out. At least, you know, there's a, there's a great advantage to having the independence that we have in this industry of being able to say, hey, I want to get into, I want to get into business and being able to, to just do it. There's a tremendous disadvantage to not having that path and not having that recognition of legitimacy when you're starting, you're starting your business out and having to re every, every person that comes along that comes into this industry, having to reinvent the wheel over and over and over again. So Thank you for you know, your, it's almost your comments funny. today. When I, when I travel around, sometimes I will meet people who don't want to share what they consider to be their um, secret sauce, right? And I always remind people, you know, secret sauce ships in a clear jar that's labeled with all the ingredients <laughs> on the outside. You know, <laughs> everybody knows what the secret sauce is, but um, there are people who just come together and help each other. And there are people who think that they've somehow figured it all out. And I think if you've been in business very, for very long, you know, it, you always move faster when you rely on other people to make the mistakes, document them, <laughs> and then turn it into a training for the rest of us. So, uh, you know, there's, I can't even count the number of mistakes that are on this, uh, this meeting right now, but it has all resulted in massive amounts of knowledge uh, and an ability to understand like how we, we as an organization need to go forward to thrive so that we as individuals can go forward and thrive. I do encourage vendors, please sign up for a meeting with us if you're interested in contributing or, or talking about the programs. Uh, at a minimum, join as a member. Uh, you could join as a registered or a paid member, either one. Uh, get on our mailing list and make sure that um, you know we uh, can contact you in our next newsletter and you can keep track of what we're up to. Do we have any other questions? We have somebody asking about in-person meetings in the future, and it's definitely on our on our roadmap. Um, you know, but until we get the right level of sponsorship, it's not not even possible. So, um, you know, we are we are definitely still in the organization stage, and um, we need you guys. I mean, we can't we can't go it alone. And uh, I would just add real quick. Uh, so, kind of your equivalence in other professions. Uh, like if you look at the American Bar Association, that came around late 1800s. The AICPA for accountants that came around late 1800s. Uh, so this is uh, a big lift for uh, for Carl and Amy, and um, you know it's just something. So you know I'm a former IT guy now. I work on the uh, the risk management side, the insurance side, and uh, one of the things that's really holding you guys back as a profession, quite frankly, is that there's no licensing, there's no standards, there's no code of ethics or code of professionalism, uh, there's no enforcement mechanism. And so, you know, I think to some degree, right, there's going to have to be a bar that gets set. And I know Amy and Carl and I'll volunteer wherever I can to do that um, to help you guys. There's going to have to be some bar that has to be set or otherwise, you know, I'm going to say that probably 95% of people on this phone call uh, you effectively have three insurance options, and that's about to be two as far as your E&O insurance goes. And so, you know, until there's movement, and I know you guys are doing that, um, it's just really going to hurt the profession. So I applaud both you guys for uh, for jumping on this grenade because that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's quite the endeavor. But wherever I can help out, just let me know. Thank you. And, you know, we're, we're a little behind, but, you know, Ada Loveless you know, invented computing in the mid 1800s. So, you know, you got to get a cut of some slack. <laughs> um, I will also say that, you know, there's been some frustration of people who say, hey, if you guys start requiring us to be competent, you know, you're going to raise the bar and then make it difficult for people to get in the industry. <sighs> I just have to say that's okay to a certain degree. We don't want to limit how people get into the industry, but we do want to say, you know, here's the path. Here's, you know, you want to get in the industry? Yes, go print up some business cards. But also, 
go here and learn about a business model so you can be successful. And I don't know if Gary Peek is on the call, but uh, you know, Gary's stats say that 25% of the people in this industry are going to go out of business in the next year. And this, this economic, uh, you know, challenge that we're facing right now with the interest rates and so forth might pretty much guarantee that that's a low percentage of the people who will go out of business. You need a strong business model so that we can rely on you to be here, to be with us in the industry. I mean, that's literally step one. So we're not trying to keep anybody out. We just want to make sure that those who decide to get in know how to be professional, literally know how to be successful. And obviously the vendors need that. They need partners that they can rely on who are not going to disappear after selling one unit. <laughs> um, Stuart asks if there are other countries that have tackled similar things. Our, our model for similar things is really what we've just been talking about, right? Industries that have a need for uh, recognition as a professional industry. As far as other countries go, um, we have had interest from IT providers in other countries in starting organizations like this in their country um, and, and wanting to have an association with us. So potentially there's an opportunity to become an international organization. Um, we, we are not ready to tackle that though. We've got our hands full just trying to to get this thing off the ground. But there is an organization that is forming in Canada right now um, that, that uh, yeah, will be our sister organization. Um, there has been interest I know from Australia in forming a similar organization. Um, these both happen to be countries that are part of the IT community in the United States. So uh, there's a interesting alliance between U.S. IT providers and Australian IT providers, we're pretty, we're pretty close. And um, same, with, same with Canada. So I'm not too surprised that those are the first two that have come to us and said, hey, we want to do what you're doing. So I do believe that this is going to be a, a worldwide movement to professionalize the industry. Um, we, are, we are the first and we will be the, the one to lead that charge. So the, I put a, a link to the uh, um, Canadian, it's the Information Technology Service Providers of Canada. Um, you know, we have within NSITSP, I know we have members from at least five countries because lots of people in Europe. Um, and I think we got a, one or two from Africa, one or two from South America. Um, we have, and you know, I should put together the stats, but we have people from other countries who've already joined and paid to be professional members because they know that this is in their interest. Um, and I, I'm overwhelmed by the number of people from other countries that have come to me and said, how can we bring this to my country? And, uh, you know, I, I've had to say, you know, let me just... <laughs> Let me just do one thing at a time because uh, we're still trying know. to bring it to our own country. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, my analogy has been, you know, like an, an ant trying to eat an elephant one bite at a time. Um, so, and, it, and it's a ridiculous amount of work. On the other hand, we're operating completely openly. So if you're in another country and you want, uh, you know, to look at our, our bylaws, they're on the website. You want to look at our budget, it's on the website. You want to look at what we're, you know, how we're formed, it's, you know, we're, we'll give you whatever we have. Uh, you know, again, this industry is sort of built around um, helping each other to be successful. And uh, this organization is no different. You know, we're, we're following that long trod path uh, within the SMBIT industry. And if I could oh, just add kind of one, one more thing here, because I know sure. people are always kind of terrified, right? When we start talking about rules and regulations and standards and ethics, uh, your peers and other similar organizations, you know, it actually kind of swings both ways, right? So there's times when, you know, my clients and other professions are asked to do something specifically that is very detrimental to their organization. And that's actually codified within the rules of their profession as being contrary uh, to the code of conduct or outside of their professional standards or the uh, state bodies or national bodies have actually put that into legislation. So it's actually a very, very useful tool. Um, it's not all necessarily scary or, you know, scary buried entries. Uh, it's also a very useful tool for business owners to kind of put in their bat belt where they can 
push back against, uh, we all know, right? Kind of what sometimes what clients want us to do versus what they should do. Uh, so I think that can be useful as well. Yeah, we yeah. have an ethics task force in progress right now. Um, and there has been a lot of discussion on how, you know, what is, what is ethics, what is code of conduct and separating those pieces. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once the ethics task force is done, the, the code of code of conduct task force is going to be spinning up, right? So we only, we only have the bandwidth to do a certain amount of things at one time at this point, you know, if we can get more of you guys on board, we can, we can do more things at the same time and speed and speed this up. And that would be amazing. But we are we are making progress exactly in that direction, uh, Joe. That's where we're that is where we're going. And um, <clears throat> along those lines of sort of spreading the word, just heads up that we have elections coming up in the fall, and so you know we're we're working on that. And we would love to have vendors to be involved and um, actually running for you know the offices to to help us on various committees and boards and so forth. So. Uh, the, the, the more hands, the lighter the work, right? That's what they say. So <clears throat> other comments or questions? Um, are vendors going to be upheld to the same ethics and code of conducts that we're going to be holding members to, like service providers and whatnot? Or is it, is it just like vendors can get involved no matter what and donate and send money and then only the members will be withheld to... Uh, I as a no. lawyer and a vendor, uh, I'd love to comment on that as a thought. I think it's a great idea. I think uh, realistically, the uh, larger corporations are going to have a really hard time adhering to the same same standards. Uh, so uh, it's it's a fair ask, and it's a challenge of the the small business space. I think is is having that transparent transparency and integrity up and down the line. Uh, but guy I've done a little coaching with is like, you know, sometimes you have to look in the mirror first and start your work there. And so, um, I think as an organization, uh, focusing on the, the, the initial focus is, is really important. So. Well, and on the vendor site, which is the nsitsp.org slash vendors, at the bottom, we have some vendor guidelines. So we, ex we certainly expect as a member of voting member of this organization, that vendors are going to follow the same rules as everybody else. Uh, we've gone out of our way, and he mentioned this, to make sure that it's one vote per company. So Microsoft gets one vote, Mindy gets one vote, <laughs> Joe gets one vote. You know what I mean? So uh, there, there's that. Um, so you know, we we do not want to be so dominated by a vendor that people see us as just somebody shilling for that vendor, right? Uh, I would, the nicest thing I can say is there's no gap to be filled by doing that. So, cool. Uh, thanks, Steve. Appreciate the comment. Uh, other comments or questions? Boy, Ben, I really want you to get involved here. Just saying. No, no I'll commit on this call. I, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll join. Okay. So we, we, we'll do awesome. it. Uh, I'm excited you, about it. I have no problem with that. Thanks. Excellent. Other folks? Ben hey, is going down Andy. the gauntlet. So, hey, wants, Andy, so Carl, let's see other, other vendors committing to, is, to join as well. Taj. Sorry to hey, cut Taj. you guys off. I left a long chat in there, Amy, and called it. I kind of let me come off camera so I won't be rude. Uh, I'm on camera, <laughs> sorry. Um, just about pushing the profession. You know, a lot of it's going to depend on your customer base. But I do have government customers. So if we're going to push the profession, compliance and ethics, we're going to be held accountable to certification and licensing, right? We're going to be held accountable to what every other profession is doing. And unfortunately, the world judges that off of, you know, license or certifications or compliance that meets industry standards. So we just have to be very careful, call the Navy. If we're gonna push this for, as a professional um, concept, we have to be ready. For example, you know, CMM, CMMC is out there, right? They could require you since you're managing other 
company's information as a managed service provider, that you're required to be stage one CMMC certified, which you know the first 15 uh, requirements under this 800-171. So if we're gonna make this push, we just have to be ready. It could go, I won't say negative, but it's just gonna put us all in a situation that could be different. So just, just some concepts I'm seeing, and I'm just thinking about my government, state, local customers, that um, I have to make sure I abide by their their requirements and initiatives. And- yeah, absolutely. You know, that's that's why we that's why we need this organization, right? We we want to talk with the people that are going to be making these. We don't want them to make those decisions in a vacuum, right? right. <laughs> that'd be that'd be the worst. I mean, we we'd end up with another HIPAA law. I mean that that would be that that would be terror. That would <laughs> no, be we terrible, don't want that. right? Um, and we don't, we don't want that. And, um, and we don't want to be, we don't want to be regulated in a way that could be detrimental to the industry. You know, we need that voice. That's why we need an organization like this. I'm hundred percent behind you with that CMMC stuff. I think CMMC is a great thing that the government has done to bring together all the different regulations that they were starting to have in, in their, in their different departments under a single banner, um, and there, there is a chance, you know, that something like that could be seen as, oh, well, let's just take that and let's just apply it to the world, right? <laughs> Even though it may not necessarily fit exactly, but it, we, we have to be in those, all those conversations so that, that our industry is represented where, where it needs to be so that we are not, we're not done too, that we are leading our own and representing ourselves. Right. Well, the other thing is there's, IT service provider is the, that we use that term because it's as broad as possible, right? There might be one person whose entire business consists of installing lighting or, you know, something where they need to follow certain guidelines, but it's not the same as somebody who needs to have an entire security stack. And, uh, you know, to your, to your comment, uh, Lisa mentioned earlier, just being able to say, if you're doing this, go consider those guidelines, right? Being able to help people find the guidelines will help them get a quicker step up in their own professionalism and in their own industry. And for some, CMMC is exactly what they need to be doing. And for others, it'll be a different set of guidelines. So, but to help people, you know, figure it out, you know, everybody starts out not knowing what, and you know, anything. (laughs) And with luck, they grow to know lots and lots. So thank you. All right. Well, I think we've gotten through all the questions, Carl, and <clears throat> people are understandably starting to drop off because yep. I think we did a good job of sticking to our 30 minutes and I appreciate another 30 minutes of Q&A. It's my favorite part of any presentation. And I'm sorry so. I started the recording late. Oh. <laughs> so that's all right. I only screw up one thing per meeting. So that was it. <laughs> I'm done. So. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. Please uh, send us emails, connect on the website, make sure you're on our mailing list. Join if you have not joined. Uh, you know, the, the basic membership is $100. So I can't imagine any, there's anybody in this industry who can't afford that. Uh, so uh, become part of us and help us become what we need to be. Uh, and with that, I think we will go ahead and close this up. We'll get the recording up as soon as we can. And uh, if you have any questions, send us an email. Thank you all. Hi, everyone.